Welcome back to We Chats with Brilliant People. In this We Chat, I talk to Dr. Mitch Abrams, who's a sports psychologist and the national expert on anger management. His knowledge on anger management has led him to be sought after by many athletes, teams, and organizations to help provide more insight on this important topic and how best to address it. Mitch is based in New Jersey, where he works as a clinician administrator for University Correctional Healthcare, which is part of Rutgers University. In this role, he oversees mental health services for five of the state prisons in New Jersey and coordinates the forensic track for pre-doctoral internships. His other focus is his private sports psychology practice, which is established for more than 20 years now. This interview took place on the JFK University campus in Pleasant Hill, California, right after he gave a day workshop to the master's students in sports psychology. So enjoy this wee chat over a cup of tea with the brilliant Mitch Abrams. Welcome to We Chats with Brilliant People, hosted by Dr. Allison Rodius, Professor of Sports Psychology at John F. Kennedy University. In each episode, Allison talks to highly successful people in music, sport, and the boardroom. She digs into the mental training techniques that they use to ride out the waves that challenge them in work and in life. So enjoy these wee chats with brilliant people. Welcome back to We Chats with Brilliant People today. Today I am super excited to talk to my friend and colleague, Dr. Mitch Abrams, who is a sports psychologist and also a national expert on the topic of anger management, especially in sports. Welcome, Mitch. Thank you for Cheers. having me. Cheers. Cheers. Clink, clink. Thank you for being part of this project. We're here in my office at JFK University. Mitch has just done a whole day's workshop, and so I'm sure he's exhausted, but uh, I dragged him in to have a wee chat with me today. So thank you for being part of this project. I always have energy to speak with you, Alison. Fantastic. That's how, I, that's how I like it. So, you know, this project is all about mental preparation, and I'm particularly interested in what the people that I'm inter interviewing actually do themselves as opposed to what advice you give to other people because you know I know that you advise and you facilitate and you consult with a, a lot of people at varying levels of functioning in sports and also in, in other environments but I'm really interested in as well in what do you do to help yourself get ready so kind of a general question I've been starting with a lot of people is what is mental preparation to you, and what, what does that look like when, when you do it? Well, I think, not so surprisingly, um, your area of expertise or your interests are going to have some overlap with how you see the world. So, being an anger management expert, some people would think, oh, well, uh, he must be someone who's always overly controlled and wrapped up and well-behaved, and those who know me, especially know me over a long period of time, know that that's not true at all. Yeah. Um, I think that really anger management is when people are able to identify how they feel um, and use their emotions to facilitate performance. And so I think that what I do, because I'm very comfortable with being angry, um, I think that I'm aware of it more often than most people, maybe even too aware. But I try to figure out where I am from an energy point of view mm. and harness it. Um, and so I don't take the position that there are good or bad emotions, but more a matter of how much helps me for the matter at hand. Mm. And um, there are certainly times when you're tired or confused or irritated, and you know that you're kind of grumpy mm -hmm. or, or maybe... Um, someone's been under your skin, and I try to be aware of how I'm feeling, um, including when I'm angry, and find the energy to get the job done the way I want it to get done. But but also understanding that life happens. Yeah. And so, 
there's a balance between utilizing your emotions to have the energy to perform at a high level um, at the same time as not being so perfectionistic that you can't be resilient when life throws your curveball because you know that that's going to happen. Right. It's unavoidable. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as soon as you've become this expert on anger management, which is fantastic, and that's why we've got you here at JFK, um, do you think you've become more or less angry being, <laughs> being the expert? Wow. Uh, Allison's going to be able to be the first person to leave me speechless. No. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think as I've gotten older, I've become more uh, self-aware. Mm -hmm. So I'm more comfortable with my anger and better able to manage it. But I don't know if that means I'm actually more or less. You know, I think that that's probably the biggest problem. When you deal with people that have anger problems, you ask them, why are you so angry? And they'll yell, I'm not angry, right? And they'll right. demonstrate. And so I don't think that I'm more angry now than I have been when I was younger. I certainly have less energy to be <laughs> as angry <laughs> yeah. as I was when I was less younger. Less time to be. Uh, yes, but I think that I'm more efficient with my energy. Yeah. And so um, rather than me seeing anger as a problem, I'm more curious and, huh, that's interesting. What am I so pissed about? And is it something that's going to interfere with me getting where I want to go mm -hmm. or not? I think that I've also learned to be much more strategic. Mm. Uh, working in prison systems that are kind of paramilitaristic, you have to know how to navigate systems. Mm -hmm. And my father told me when I was very young, and I didn't appreciate it then, um, and he said, you know, when you have problems with people, you really want to be able to handle them in cold blood, not hot blood. Mm -hmm. And what he was capturing, and again, I didn't realize it at the time, was how high levels of anger interfere with decision making mm -hmm. versus being calculating and, and decisive. So when you are better able at adjusting your moods, you're able to figure out which strategy works best. And the truth of the matter is for many things high levels of anger interfere. So I would say that my baseline anger level is less than it was when I was younger. Mm. I've learned a lot about how it's led to um, challenging situations and sometimes problems that I've created to my, for myself. Uh, but it also would be a little bit misleading to think if you follow me around, I'm just a tranquil, passive soul that never has any <laughs> you know, minor temper tantrums here or there. Well, don't we all? I mean, bl <laughs> blame me. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing is that, you know, you've you've kind of, uh, not necessarily a label, I can't think of a better word than label, but you've, you've got this distinguished honor in a way of being this expert in our field on this topic on anger management. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, is it the predominant emotion that you are aware of because of the you know what you've done in the field and the book that you've written and you know um and you have created this forum if you like for for having these important conversations so for you has it become the thing that you are most aware of um i don't know i think it's it's kind of an artifact of society's problems mm. You know, I've become the expert in anger management primarily because no one else has. Mm. Um, am I interested in it? Yes. Have I been working with violent people uh, in the far extremes in prison, psychopaths, sex offenders, etc.? Yes. Have I worked with uh, people with severe anger management problems and domestic violence issues with athletes up to the pro levels? Yes. But I think that the thing that's most empowering is um, I'm willing to put on the table the nonsensical shame that people put on anger that interferes with the conversations. And so there are people who disagree with me, which is perfectly fine. And my answer is, okay, well, you can disagree with me if you want, but only if you're willing to talk about it more. And if you talk about it more, then we increase awareness. And then we find out different ways to do things. I mean, anger is a very misunderstood emotion. It's, it's multiply determined and people are very quick to damn you for having it. But it's as normal as any other emotion. So am I proud of, of this title? Well, I think there are some people who think I don't merit it. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I am because I think that anger is a natural part of the human condition. I think that people that are high achievers have learned how to mm. um, manage their, their emotions. And the truth is, even the uh, successful athletes that have had anger transgressions, you take a look at it, and 95 plus percent of the time, 
they're not mm -hmm. having problems. You know, it's what I'm always looking for. It's like, why is this person having difficulty here? But all of these other situations, they're able to manage it. Mm -hmm. People that are, you know, we talk about stimulus differentiation problems, right? So you, a football player that's reinforced for violence on the football field, 300 yards into the parking lot, it's a felony arrest. It's amazing that there isn't more spillage. Yeah. And the truth is, is that most people do a real good job. Um, but if you're not aware of it, there's certainly the potential that that one time can be too far mm -hmm. with uh, consequences that can't be undone. Right. And and life doesn't always give you a flashing yellow light saying, warning, this is the day. Yeah. Um, Don't do it today. It, exactly. It would be kind of inconvenient. That would be nice, though, if it gave you some kind of warning, wouldn't it? Or well, but I think that that's where coaches could really do a lot towards fixing this. You yeah. Know, coaches are real good at helping athletes with motivation and getting them amped up and rah-rah, but they don't do a whole lot of teaching them how to pull it back. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. so, so when you have an athlete, and I do a lot of work with football players, but it's certainly not, it's, it's just a good example. If you're constantly amping these guys up and then they're so angry and so intense, we know that high levels of anger interfere with decision making, so then they jump off sides because they're so amped up, and you're angry at them. Instead of saying, listen, we know that there's a level. If you go above that level, bad things are going to happen. I want you right up to that level without getting over. Mm -hmm. Coaches don't teach that, at least not yet. Yeah. One thing that you mentioned um, early on uh, a few minutes ago was about your awareness of it. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounded to me very much like, you know, we teach with mindfulness. And so you become aware of it, you noticed it, you almost labeled it, mm -hmm. and then you let it go, or what did you, can you talk a little bit about that process? Now or then? It, yeah, go, do both. Well, I mean, I, I remember. What, what's then? When, when are you well, referring well, to? Well, you know, people ask you, why are you so interested in something? And people are usually interested in something that they have some personal relevance yeah. with. Yeah. And uh, my story, I mean, I grew up as a poor kid in a poor neighborhood, so there was plenty to be angry at the world about. I mean, I was financially poor but family rich. I was for, fortunate in that uh, my parents were sacrificed us having a decent um, financial life for having the issue of um, availability. Like, you know, when people complain that I'm too cocky, they can blame my parents for that because um, what I learned very early on was it didn't matter if I fell flat on my face. Hmm. I'd always have a place that I could come back to. You knew you were okay. I'd be loved and accepted. And and, and so that allowed me to take chances, hmm. to be confident to do things that other people might not. But there was plenty to be angry about as well. And I remember I was telling the story, story earlier. I was about 15 years old at the time. And I was raging about something. You know, what could a 15-year-old boy be raging about? It must have been a girl, right? And just to put, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and to put it in context, you were brought up in, you were born and brought up in Brooklyn. Correct. Okay. So we, I lived in Starrett City, which was um, and is a, a small subsection of East New York. And, and when I was growing up in the 70s, there was um, uh, Howard Beach, which was Italian and, and Jewish, and Canarsie, which was Italian and Jewish, and the higher SES also wasn't just uh, ethnically different, um, but they, we were separated by creeks, by waters, mm. and oh. so we were much more influenced by East New York over the top, where there was a lot of crime, and in Starrett City, we were, uh, you were in or out, depending on whether or not you played sports. Yeah. That was the equalizer. Nobody cared about color of skin. In fact, there were times that there were people from outside of Starrett City that had a problem with me. Um, and all of my friends that were African-American made sure that those people knew from outside that you couldn't mess with Mitch because he's with us, right? Mm. But nonetheless, there was a lot of violence. There was crime around us, gang involvement. And I was angry. Um, uh, angry that uh, I was growing up poor. Why can't I have all, you know, better things and all the rest of that stuff? And didn't appreciate the good things that I had in my family that a lot of people were lacking. At any rate, I was angry at the world, and I was about 15 years old. I was raging. I was joking. It was about a girl. I have no idea what it was about, but it's a reasonable guess. So, it sounds like a good story. It's a, well, it makes the story good anyway. <laughs> Someone will listen and listen. And they'll go, I was that girl. Um, <laughs> she so, can write it. Ex exactly. So, um, uh, so I'm listening. You know, If you're in a good rage, what do you need? You need music. 
right? Yeah. I don't even remember what I was listening to. I just know it was loud and yeah. heavy bass, and I'm, I'm, I'm like kind of ranting to myself. I'm looking out the window, and I have uh, one of these folding chairs. And you know, back then there were all these tubular steel. Uh, folding chairs that you only see like in WWE now or something. Anyway, um, I didn't realize uh, my door was closed. I didn't realize my mother was behind me. She opened the door and she said, Mitch, and she startled me. And I ripped the chair like it was paper. And I I couldn't do that now if I tried, right? <laughs> um, and I was just, I was so amped up and I was yeah. startled. So it was like, I was already angry and I got startled and scared and I ripped it. And I turned and I saw my mother. It was the only time my my whole life I ever saw her afraid. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is my mom. She's afraid of me. And she looked me right in the eyes and said, you better get that shit together yeah. because otherwise it's going to destroy you. You're going to do bad things. You're never going to go where you could go in life. That was the first time I became aware of it. Um, and there was a lot along the way that made it difficult to, to understand. Um, not to mention the fact that you know, you're playing sports and people expect you to be tough. Expect you to be willing to fight. Um, you know, I, I worked in the health and fitness business. I was bouncing in clubs in New York City, and there was all of this violence around me. So you looked the part as well. You looked like a, a violent person only because the way you know, as a bouncer, I'm I, I'm thinking, well, you you probably looked like a bouncer. Even before that, um, it was funny because in Starrett City, I went to the South Shore High School, which was a little bit further away, and it had was a, had a very diverse crowd. And there was a lot of upper middle class white folks there. I was one of the kids from the street. So they were scared of me. (laughs) They were scared of me. I wasn't a little guy then, but they were scared of me. And in fact, I remember there was a time we were taking the bus home um, in Brooklyn. And all of these hoodlums would get on the back of the bus. And they're getting ready to start robbing everybody. Ripping gold chains and all the rest of that stuff. And I hear one guy say, hey Mitch, watch my radio. I can't watch your radio while you're robbing my friends. What the hell's wrong with you? But wound up, and, and it was really empowering because yeah. I realized that the sport connect because I played ball with these guys. The sport connection started making it mm. different. And you also learn when you grow up on the streets to carry yourself in a certain way that if you can um, intimidate people and um, if they're worried about you before you're worried about them, it's like Sun Tzu, Art of War. You know, you beat you you beat your opponent before you even get to the battlefield. So I learned um, how to carry myself in a way that I didn't have to fight. Hmm. Um, So when I was bouncing in clubs in City, I was certainly not one of the biggest guys there, but five years I had like two fights. And and I learned a lot about identifying how people felt. It wasn't the person in front of me that I was worried about. It was three or four guys away and how they're amping up. Uh. So you start realizing that violence is almost never random, that you look for the nonverbals. You look for, you know, if they're drunk, they're disorganized. They're easier to manage. If they're rageful, they're going to be locked eyes with somebody. So, you know, if I see the two guys are lined up and they're like pit bulls looking at one another, I'm not going to get in between them. They're going to kill me. Both of them will kill me. But I'll be like, why are you staring at that guy when that girl right over there is looking at you? Guy hears the girls looking at him. What? Where? And as soon as they look, I walk them. Then you walk them and you take them away. So... Before I even got to graduate school, I started realizing how to manage my own anger, Mm -hmm. how to identify it in other people, and how to um, help people disengage without losing face, Mm -hmm. especially for guys, because guys, if my pride is at stake and everyone's watching, uh, you know, there are some people who believe um, if you get to prison, because this is an achievement in life, right? If you wind up in prison, hit the first guy so everybody knows you're not afraid of hitting, Mm -hmm. you're not afraid of fighting. But the truth is, the toughest guy in prison never has to fight. Right. And that's what you're trying to achieve. And it's it's true in sports as well. You know, you, you get on a field. I don't care what the sport is. If you look at someone else and you look at them going, oh, boy, that guy's big. They're scary. They're going to throw the ball past me. I'm not going to be able to tackle him. You're defeated ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do this when we're training people in prison. We want them to be aware of how they feel. There's no such thing as a bad feeling. But you be damn sure that you decide what you let people see right. of how you're feeling. I mean, you know, even if you're intimidated, you want the other person to think they're the one who's in trouble. You know, then you know you get up on the pitcher's mound and you're looking at a guy who could probably bark at the ball and it'll go 400 feet, and you look at him like I own you. Mm-hmm. Um, you can beat 
people in those battles before you ever get there. And, and I think that in the far extremes, anger hurts that process. Um, and so it's a matter of keeping it in that zone of where anger can help you do what you're trying to do. So like I was saying about um, you, know, when, you, when you feel angry, and let's just keep on anger, I guess. I, you know, there's many more emotions that we could touch on around preparation. But So you, you get angry, you are aware of it, you notice it, and then what's the, because I think people listening to this will find this one of the most new, useful steps is, okay, you've noticed it, you've labeled it, which is helpful, and in some ways it dissipates an emotion when you label it. Absolutely. What is the next step, and uh, what do you do with it after that, so you know, people Ex can learn no, from this? Excellent, except that very often that first part actually disengages the whole process. Mm. It's like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Simply by observing it, you change it. Okay. And one of the biggest problems with anger is that people don't realize when they're too far until they you know, they don't know when they've passed the line until they already have. Okay, so they're in the they're in the red. Already. Ex exactly. I talk about that being you know, your explosion threshold. That once you get there, if you explode. You're going to need physical restraint, a lot of it, yeah. medications, a lot of it, or you let it run its course. So the key is to identify all the different places where, es where you're escalating that gives you opportunities to intervene. So if you're in a situation that you can identify that you're getting angry, and the easiest way to do it, as far as I'm concerned, is paying attention to how your body changes. Um, all of the things that we associate with getting ready to go, ironically, are also the same things you feel in the heart of competition. Mm. Your heart rate increases, mm -hmm. your muscles are tense, your breathing rate increases. You're more alert. You're more alert. And if, if you're not in a sporting environment or in an actual dangerous situation, mm -hmm. that's anger. That, that should be your trigger. If you're in a sporting situation, it's going to be much harder to figure it out because mm. this physiological experience is normal for competition. And sometimes people have a lot of difficulty re realizing it themselves. So if you have teammates, you're able to use one another to say, hey, that guy's he's a little bit up too high. Going back to that situation before, uh, assuming that that awareness does not just you know make it dissolve on itself because anger is not necessarily soluble in awareness, you need to have as many different tools in your toolbox. Um, and you need to have them well practiced so that they're ready when you're, whenever you need them. For for me, I talk all the time about um, breathing exercises, muscle relaxation. Uh, music can be very powerful in either direction, both to amp you up or to calm you down. Um, you'll hear people that call themselves anger management experts talking about, well, you, when you're angry, just punch a, a punching bag. Mm -hmm. And and the problem is, is that it works. You're like, so why is that a problem? Well, because you're going to feel better after you hit the bag. And so you reinforce well, it. What if you don't have a bag? But you have your girlfriend, right? right? Or your wife, or whatever. Exactly. So so the issue is is that you want to have as many different tools as possible. Like, when we talk about muscle relaxation, I know that for me, when I get tense, my, uh, my, my it sits in my traps. Mm. You know? So there'll be times that I'm reading emails, and anybody who's read emails know... How, how angering that could be. And I'm like, why am I so tense? The next thing I know, I realize my, my shoulders are up by my ears, mm. right? And I know if I relax, and simply rolling yeah. my shoulders and bringing them down relaxes that muscle group, mm -hmm. all of my muscle groups calm down. Okay. And that's a go-to for me. Because it's, you've practiced that, though. Ex exactly. You, that didn't just happen by chance. And right. you, you can't suddenly relax one body, body part and everything else falls into place unless you've done it for a while. That's exactly right. And, and people don't seem to appreciate that. Any of the skills that you use for de-escalation, they have to be practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about athletes, they understand the importance of reps. Why would you not have the same importance of reps with mental skills? Well, unfortunately, athletes are not always as forward thinking, right? So athletes are more likely to ask for help when they're struggling. Right. Rather than this is your preparation, this is your mind work that you do off season or in between. And and because a lot of athletes, whether they have problems with anger or stress or anxiety, they also have difficulty sleeping. So all of these situations or skills that you use to help calm yourself down also help with sleep. Mm. And so the and we know that if you are sleep deprived, then you're more likely to be grumpy and then the cycle continues, right? So the goal is have as many tools in your toolbox as possible, practice them, and have them available. 
Um, we know that there are some people that have cognitive distortions, you know, we call that a hostility bias, where people are just more likely to see neutral stimuli as provocative, right? right. You know, these are people that wake up on the wrong side of the bed every single day. <laughs> And, um, and it's not that those skills or those problems can't be fixed. The question is always whether or not they want to. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like Prochaska's uh, stages of change. You know, these people are pre-contemplative. They don't see, it's egocentric. I'm perfectly fine. When they realize that this is not going to end well for me, well, now, you know, the, the sky's the limit. The key is to have as many tools in your toolbox as possible because it's useless to say, I want to calm down if you don't have a means to do it. The other thing, and after you identify what skills they have and add to what they don't have, is trigger recognition. Mm. Just as I said, you know, we talk about how important self-awareness is. Most people don't realize that they're angry until they're past the line. Well, we all have our own personal triggers. Right. You know, some of it are more obvious, direct. You know, someone punches you, someone says something bad about you, but... What's um, a trigger for you? Um... I normally don't advertise my weaknesses because that kind of gives me... Give me just a, a little tiny one, not a, a big one. A little tiny one? Um, imply you're going to hurt my family. Right, which is, a no, I, you know, yeah, I but think that, that's relatively... That will, that will get a disproportionate reaction for me. Right. I, someone does but that. But I think I'm that not, would make I, a lot of people angry. I'm not a psychologist when that happens. Right, right. Yeah, I mean... Um, so what do you do? Okay, so this is a good example for us to wrap up with. You get triggered, mm -hmm. and you know it's a very psychological term that we use, which just means something has happened or something that somebody said, uh -huh. and you have an emotional reaction to it. Yep. And it could be brought up by something that's happened in the past, mm -hmm. and, it, uh, and it often is. And what that means is you are now reacting. So... Then what? Well, I think I, you go back to the lessons that you learned, and I keep hearing my father say, you know, cold blood, not hot blood. I had the pleasure of meeting my 16-year-old daughter's boyfriend this summer. Mm. And, How did uh, that go? It went well for me. <laughs> it went pretty well for him also. And, and you know, it was actually very valuable, I think, for all parties. Um, you know, he was very respectful, played the role the correct way. And I, I said to him, I said, look, um, emotional... Um, relationships are difficult and emotions rise and fall and if you emotionally hurt her that might happen and she might emotionally hurt you too if you physically hurt her it's not gonna end well for you you know and I realized at that moment I'm starting to escalate and he realized that I'm starting to escalate and and I hear my father in the background saying cold blood not hot blood and I just said Listen, these are the circumstances under which this relationship continue. Can can continue. Can you respect that? Can you, you know, meet those terms? And he said, Yes, sir, and he was respectful. And I said, Good, let's order some dinner. But I realized as I'm talking to him that he could say all the right things and still hurt my daughter. Sure. And but it's the awareness. It's the awareness. Um and it's a very fragile feeling. I mean, you know, especially men, we have this fantasy that we're going to be in control all the time, which is an illusion, right? And when when we have children, we have the fantasy that we could protect them from the world. More bullshit, right? It would be nice if we could. So I think that triggers really boil down to what our biggest fears and insecurities are. And if we could recognize them, we try to avoid them, whether it's keeping our emotions in check or making sure behavioral situations never get there. Uh, because... You know, in the far extreme, sometimes people do things that you can never take back. And I also think uh, extending that issue of, of forward thinking is prediction of consequences, right? So if, if he hurt my daughter, I have all kinds of evilness planned for him. But then I won't be there to take care of her. Right. And she needs that. And so that's something I try to put into the hopper. But admittedly, that ain't easy. And also, I think one of the key messages, you know, across the board with psychology is just because you're triggered by something doesn't mean that you have to react in a certain way. Yep. It doesn't mean that it predicts, you know, even if you have the emotion, even if you have those feelings, it doesn't mean that you have to do the behavior. Yes. It just means you need to notice it and you need to do something about it. So that's, the, that's, that's the difference between... A, a regular emotion, something that escalates into anger, something that goes from anger to violence. That's 
Absolutely. Talk, all those steps are important to know. And someone on the outside validating that. Right. right. Saying, I know when that happens, it feels like you must react. The truth is that's not true. Right. You don't have to. Right. Um, it's okay not to. You're still a man. The, the, yeah, I th- yeah, I think that there's that's a big piece of it. Uh, one of the reasons why men have so much difficulty with, uh, with violence and anger is because we're much more fragile. We're much more fragile, we're much more insecure, and when that happens, we feel the need that we might, we must protect our manhood. Our, our, ego, our ego's survival is at stake. Mm. And the truth is, if you really are uh, somewhat of substance, that's not so easily taken away. Mm-hmm. You could have confidence in that. I like that. Well, okay. Well, that's, I think that's a great way to uh, wrap up this wee chat. Um, I could talk about this for ages, even though we've I've been listening to you all day. I think it's a, it's a fascinating topic, and you're a fascinating person to have this conversation with. So, one last question. Okay. That I have been asking everybody. Okay. If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you try to do tomorrow? Try to be a better man. Mm. Could you try that anyway? Yes. <laughs> I uh, honestly, um, I think performers that perform at a high level um, selectively ignore the risk of failure. Mm. It's kind of like something to consider. I think people f- mistake. Um, and interchangeably talk about confidence, cockiness, and arrogance. And I've certainly been accused of all of the above. Um, I know I'm good at a lot of things. Uh, I know there are lots that I'm not good at. I don't advertise them. But I think that when I control the controllable, um, there's very little that I can't do. So... Uh, I think that being the best person you can be, the best man, father, husband, all the rest of those things, that's something I try to do every day, some days better than others. Um, but if someone said, you know, you can't fail, I would still go the same way. I, 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 wouldn't, I really don't see the possibility of failure as something that's going to stop me. Mm-hmm. It might be an obstacle. And so, uh, you know, you will not fail tomorrow. Or maybe I will. I'll get them the next day. In prison, we have a we have a line. If I don't get you in the wash, I'll get you in the rinse. <laughs> right. So there's no such thing as a failure who keeps trying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not so worried about failure. You know, you have good support systems and people that validate who you are and and you know in your heart who you are. Uh, is, you know, a failure is a momentary thing. It's mm-hmm. a huge difference between losing and being a loser. Yeah. I'm not worried about the latter. That's good. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for being part of the WeChats project. It's been an absolute pleasure pleasure and a privilege and having you here from all the way on the East Coast Mm -hmm. over here to the West Coast. It's been a pleasure and uh, thank you so much for being a part of it. It's my pleasure. I always appreciate your hospitality and hopefully uh, we continue to keep the students thinking. Uh, hopefully, yes. Well, I mean, it's curiosity is so important. Yeah. It's so important. So, you know, even if people don't agree, if you could provoke them and get them thinking. And have a conversation. A wee chat. Wee chats, <laughs> they, 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 can't walk, they can't walk away without getting smarter. Yeah, brilliant. Perfect. Okay, well, tune in next time to see who we have on WeChats with Brilliant People. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye for now. We hope you enjoyed these WeChats. You can follow WeChats with Brilliant People on Twitter at WeChats and Facebook. And subscribe to the podcast series on iTunes or any Droid platform. WeChats with brilliant people.